This video was brought to you by Squarespace. Take a look at this mask. It looks like a convex face protruding outwards. Now, let's rotate it. At this point, you know what you expect to see. A concave mask protruding inwards. However, somehow you get a strong sense that something is off, and the mask sure looks like it got warped to be convex again, even though part of you knows that it's not the case. But why is your brain so stubbornly convinced that the mask is protruding outward? The answer actually reveals something remarkable about the nervous system. What if I told you that everything you're seeing, hearing, and feeling at this moment isn't actually reality? That it is a controlled hallucination, your brain constructing and testing hypotheses about what's out there? There is a powerful theory in neuroscience called the free energy principle which proposes something mind-bending. According to this framework, your brain isn't passively receiving information about the world. It is actively generating predictions about what should be out there and then uses the sensory input to merely check if those predictions are right. Today we're going to explore this fascinating theory. We'll discover why evolution turned our brains into prediction machines, how this helps us survive in an uncertain world, and why sometimes, like in this mask illusion, our brain's predictions can overwrite what's actually in front of us. But first, let's go back to the beginning. To understand why our brains work this way, we need to look at the fundamental problem they evolved to solve. The main purpose of the brain, like any trait favored by evolution, is to increase the chances of survival and reproduction. To achieve this, organisms need to react to stimuli appropriately. For instance, if you sense harmful chemicals, you need to swim away from them. But such simple reactions can be accomplished through basic biochemistry, no complex nervous system required. In fact, you don't even need to be multicellular for this, just a bag of liquid with a few chemical reactions would work. However, as organisms began to inhabit more complex environments, they faced the challenge of the outside world being noisy, ambiguous, and often providing only partial information. For instance, let's say that over the course of your lifetime, you learned that tigers mean danger and should be avoided. To your brain, a tiger is essentially any pattern on the retina that looks similar to this. Now, suppose one day your retina registers a pattern of activity that looks like this. If you had a primitive nervous system that determined whether something is a tiger or not by pure pattern matching, the similarity might be below the threshold and you will get eaten. This is where brains come in. They evolved not just as reaction machines but as sophisticated model builders that try to explain sensory inputs by inferring their hidden causes. In this case, your brain might have an internal model of what a tiger is how it looks like and what will happen if you get caught. Importantly, the brain also knows that in the real world, objects may be occluded by other objects. Thus, the brain is capable to combine those two facts together and come up with an explanation that what you are seeing isn't a totally novel object that looks like a half tiger, but rather is an actual full tiger occluded by the tree, so it better run. This ability to fill in the gaps and come up with plausible explanations for sensory data is at the heart of the brain's evolutionary success. In essence, you can think of your brain like a judge weighting evidence on a scale. On one side, there is what your senses are telling you, the raw data coming in through your eyes, ears, and other modalities. On the other side, there is what you already know about how the world works, your prior beliefs built up through evolution and experience. Your brain is constantly trying to find the perfect balance between those two forces. When they are out of balance, we can think of it as creating a kind of tension or energy in the brain, which it wants to minimize. This tension is what neuroscientists call the variational free energy, or just free energy for short. Let's go back to our tiger example. When your senses show you half a tiger pattern, that creates a puzzle. One explanation might be that you are seeing a strange half-tiger creature, but that explanation would have very high free energy. It conflicts strongly with your prior knowledge 
that tigers are whole animals that are symmetric. The other explanation, that it is a complete tiger partially hidden behind something, has a much lower free energy. It fits both what you are seeing and what you know about how the world works. Brains minimize free energy to adapt to specific niches in the environment. And if you're looking to carve out your own niche online, our today's sponsor, Squarespace, is exactly what you need. Squarespace is an all-in-one platform that makes it super simple to build a professional website and get it up and running. Starting a website can be an intimidating experience, especially when you're faced with a blank HTML file not knowing where to begin. This is where Squarespace Design Intelligence feature comes in. Their suite of generative AI tools can create a fully customized site based on your business type and brand preferences, complete with images and content tailored to your liking, serving as a great starting point. From there, you have complete creative control. Customize colors and fonts, use their intuitive drag-and-drop interface, and even add animations to make it stand out. But Squarespace isn't just a website builder, it's a complete business solution. Whether you want to create online courses, launch email campaigns, or start accepting payments through multiple methods, they provide all the tools you need in one place. Check out squarespace.com for a free trial. And once you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash artem to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. But how does the brain actually implement such sophisticated explanations? The key challenge is that sensory data, like the pattern of light on your retina, consists of thousands of neurons firing in complex patterns. The brain needs some way to compress this vast amount of information into a manageable form by finding commonalities and hidden structure in the data. The solution found by evolution was quite elegant. Alongside neurons that directly correspond to sensory inputs, the brain evolved neurons that don't directly connect to the outside world. These hidden or latent neurons learn to represent meaningful features or causes at different levels of abstraction. At a high level, there might be neurons encoding abstract causes like tiger or object occlusion. These connect to intermediate neurons, representing things like stripes or fur texture, which in turn connect to neurons encoding more basic causes like edges or color. For such latent neurons, because they don't interface with the outside world, there is no ground truth on what their activity should be. In fact, the brain is free to choose whichever latents it wants. So how can we test which world model is the best to select among them? While we can't directly verify the latents, we can verify their consequences. A good set of latent causes should be able to explain the patterns we observe in our sensory neurons. And by explain, I mean they should contain enough information to decently reconstruct the source sensory data from this compressed representation. Here is an intuitive way to think about this. Imagine a three-dimensional scene in a computer graphics program like Blender. The scene might have just a few adjustable parameters – sliders controlling the rotation of the object, the position of the light source, and the object's color. When you render this scene, you get a high-resolution image, perhaps a thousand by thousand pixels. That is a million variables, each with its own color value. Yet, all possible images you could render from the scene are controlled by just those three slider positions which contain all the information you need to reconstruct the scene fully. For example, if you wanted to share one of those images with a friend, you wouldn't need to send them all the million pixels. You could just send three numbers, the positions of each slider, and if they have the same scene setup, they could generate the identical image. This is similar to how latent neurons encode abstract high-level features of the observed data. And the rendering process, the complex computation under the hood of the graphics software that transforms slider positions to rendered pixels, corresponds to a so-called generative network, or generative model, inside the brain. You can think of this generative model as connection weights between latent and sensory neurons. 
plus additional neural circuits that carry out this reconstruction and uncompress the latent representation. Now, imagine you are setting up the scene to match photographs of real objects. You would quickly discover that some slider combinations occur much more frequently than others in the real world. Light sources are usually above objects, not below them, and objects tend to rest on surfaces in stable positions. Through experience, you will develop an intuitive sense of which parameter combinations are more likely to occur. This is exactly what your brain does. It learns which patterns of latent neuron activity correspond to real-world situations and are thus more common than others. These learned probabilities of different causes are what we call priors, because they represent your prior beliefs before you take the observed sensory data into account. Priors are crucial for making sense of ambiguous situations. If you are walking through a city park and catch a glimpse of something orange and striped in your peripheral vision, your brain will favor explanations that are common in this context. Perhaps a child's stuffed toy or somebody wearing a striped shirt. Even though the sensory data might be consistent with the tiger cause, your prior belief about how unlikely it is to encounter a tiger in a city park helps you arrive at a more reasonable interpretation. However, if you are on a safari, the same orange-striped glimpse would likely trigger a very different interpretation, because your priors about what is likely in that environment are quite different. Hence, the generative model the brain uses to make sense of the outside world has two components. The prior, which tells us how likely various causes are, and the generator network, which can synthesize sensory data for a given cause. In real life, however, we constantly face the opposite problem. We have sensory input and need to figure out what caused it. It is called inference, inferring causes from observations. And this is where things get a bit tricky. Let's return to our Blender analogy. Imagine you are given just the final image and asked to figure out the slider positions that created it. This reverse problem faces a fundamental computational challenge. To find the right causes, in general, you would need to try every possible combination of slider positions, render an image from each one, and compare it with your target image. Even with just three sliders, each with a hundred possible positions, that's a million combinations to check. Your brain faces the same problem, but on a much larger scale. It has millions of latent neurons, each with many possible activity levels. Checking every combination would take longer than the age of the universe. And yet, brains solve this problem nearly instantaneously. When you get a glimpse of an orange-striped pattern, you don't have time to test billions of possible causes. If that pattern really is a tiger, you need to figure it out fast. So how does the brain manage this seemingly impossible task? The key idea is that while we can't directly invert the generative model and compute exact probabilities of how different causes are likely given the sensory observation, we can try to find an approximation. The brain has a separate network, a recognition model, which works in the opposite direction by mapping a sensory observation to the distribution of causes. Importantly, this result is only an approximation a rough first guess of what causes might explain the sensory observation. To improve the guess, the brain might need to do multiple rounds of engaging recognition and generation networks in a loop to arrive at a refined estimate. Crucially, for this system to work, the recognition and generative networks need to be aligned with each other. They need to speak the same language of causes. When the recognition network suggests a particular pattern of latent neuron activity as an explanation, the generative network should produce sensory patterns that match what the recognition network has learned to associate with those causes. This alignment isn't automatic, it needs to be learned through experience. Now when we've seen how the brain uses recognition and generative models to make sense of the world, let's see how they work together to minimize free energy. 
When your brain encounters a new sensory input, these two models engage in a rapid dance. The recognition model proposes possible explanations, and the generative model checks how well they work. If there is a mismatch, if the generative model predicts sensory patterns that don't match what you're actually experiencing, your brain adjusts the explanation and tries again. This back and forth continues until your brain finds an explanation that minimizes free energy, one that explains both the sensory input and aligns well with your prior beliefs. This is the process of perception, when the brain rapidly adjusts the activity of those latent neurons we talked about, tweaking its explanation until it finds the one that minimizes free energy. This happens incredibly quickly, usually within fractions of a second. But there is also a longer-term process of learning. Over time, the brain gradually refines both models by adjusting connection weights between the neurons. The recognition model gets better at making initial guesses, and the generative model gets better at predicting their sensory consequences, and builds up better prior expectations of causes. Importantly, even though perception and learning operate on two different timescales, they both serve the same overarching goal, reducing uncertainty in the world by building optimal models of the environment and finding explanations for sensory data within those models. Now we understand exactly why the brain refuses to see the mask as concave, even when we know that's what it is. Your brain is facing a dilemma. The pattern of light and shadows on your retina suggests a hollow, inward protruding shape. But this interpretation would violate one of your brain's strongest prior beliefs, that faces protrude outward. From the free energy perspective, your brain has two possible explanations. Either that there is a concave face in front of you, or that there is normal, convex face with somewhat unusual lighting. The brain chooses the explanation which minimizes total free energy. The prior belief about faces being convex is incredibly strong, built from a lifetime of experience. As a result, the brain would rather assume there is something unusual about the lighting than to accept the existence of an inwardly protruding face. The free energy is lower when slightly mismatching sensory evidence than when violating the fundamental expectation about faces. And knowing the truth doesn't break the illusion, as it is rooted in a more evolutionarily conserved circuitry for visual perception. So even the analytical part of the brain cannot overwrite this. Let's put all the pieces together. At its core, the free energy principle suggests that our brains are essentially prediction machines, constantly trying to explain the chaos of incoming sensory information. They achieve it by having a generative model which can come up with new sensory patterns and a recognition model working in tandem to arrive at the best explanation, the compressed representation of sensory patterns that balances observed evidence with prior beliefs. This balance is quantified by the value of free energy, with lower values corresponding to favorable explanations that fit both the incoming sensory data and existing beliefs about what's likely to be observed according to the current world model. Of course, we've only scratched the surface of this fascinating theory. While I chose to keep this explanation conceptual, focusing on intuitive understanding rather than mathematical formalism, there is another layer of beauty to discover. The mathematics behind the free energy principle, although initially daunting, actually reveals an elegant framework that ties these ideas together. In future videos, we'll explore this deeper mathematical foundation and see how it connects to modern machine learning, allowing us to build artificial systems that, like our own brains, can perceive, predict, and develop their own models of the world.